Okay, uh, I'd like to open the session, uh, Gil Mazaltov again. Uh, the first speaker, Felix Worley, uh, will tell us about uh, blood su oxygen saturation as a dynamic magnetic resonance tracer. Thank you, Michal. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, prestigious symposium. I, I, I really feel honored to be here. And uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, some recent work we did uh, for a quantifying oxygen saturation in deep lying vessels and in conjunction with the measurement of flow obtain uh, information on uh, uh, organ uh, uh, oxygen consumption. And given Gill's prior work that precedes this by decades and his interest in oxygen, and oxygen uh, or, uh, organ uh, oxygen consumption, we would like to dedicate this work to Gill. Hemoglobin oxygen saturation, of course, is a, one of the most the fundamental parameters. And uh, along, once we know SVO2 and SAO2, and we know flow, we can compute the, the CMRO2 in the brain, or call it uh, just the MRO2. The knowledge of this parameter is, of course, uh, uh, of uh, critical importance in many clinical situations. Ordinarily, we measure oxygen saturation by blood gas analysis, which is invasive. Pulse oximetry measures SAO2, uh, usually at the peripheral location. We can also measure SAO2. Uh, as I uh, will show you a little later. And near-infrared measures essentially tissue uh, oxygenation. There are many clinical uses, study of uh, neurometabolic and neurovascular coupling. Congenital heart disease is one. Unfortunately, I uh, uh, won't have the time to talk about that. Uh, we have some results in babies with uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, but there won't be enough time. SVO2 can be used as a tracer, for example, uh, to study the effect, the response to induced ischemia. We can also evaluate hypoxemia. And by hypoxemia, we mean inadequate arterial saturation as it occurs, for example, in sleep apnea. Well, the, the fundamentals of uh, this method, of course, have to do with hemoglobin uh, uh, magnetism. And uh, in the oxy state, once the oxygen is bound to the porphyrin iron, we are in a low spin state, and hemoglobin is actually very slightly diamagnetic relative to water. That is different in the deoxy state. In uh, this case, uh, the system switches to a high spin state, a spin of two, and that's really all there is to, to say about it. But how can we measure oxygen saturation? Well, the principle is that we model the vessel as a paramagnetic cylinder. And of course, the magnetic field inside is homogeneous if the length is much greater than the diameter, because it is essentially an ellipsoid, and that is true for all ellipsoids. And an infinitely long cylinder, of course, is an ellipsoid. It doesn't even matter whether the vessel is circular in cross section, uh, it uh, equally works uh, if it is uh, elliptical. The field shift uh, can be quantified by field mapping, and uh, this is the fundamental equation. Uh, so there is an angular dependence. Uh, the, the, uh, Okay, thank you. Fine. Th thank you. Uh, the field is proportional to susceptibility difference. 
between inside and outside the, the vessel. Now, I should say that uh, if the vessel is tilted relative to the static magnetic field, and that uh, can occur even though, say, the major uh, conduits uh, to the brain, like the carotid arteries, are pretty much parallel to the field, then the field outside also becomes inhomogeneous, but that falls off uh, uh, rapidly, actually, as the inverse square uh, of the distance. So we do essentially field mapping. We quantify the phase relative to uh, a re reference tissue. And from that, once we uh, compute uh, delta chi, it is related to delta chi uh, DO, uh, deoxy, uh, and that's a, a most important fundamental quantity is proportional to the hematocrit in one minus HBO2. Now the hematocrit we, we know the critical constant is this, and there has been a great deal of controversy in the literature of what it actually is, and some of the work that has been done is based on 0 0.18. But it's, uh, we re-examined this, and we are pretty sure now uh, that this is uh, the accurate uh, quantity. We have uh, validated this first in phantoms, just a, a set of uh, parallel tubes. Uh, of uh, different concentrations of uh, paramagnetic, uh, in, in th this uh, case, uh, gadolinium DTPA. And we can, of course, compute the susceptibility, and you can see this is a very good relationship with the slope close to unity. And this works in vivo as well. This is at the neck, just uh, uh, slightly above the bifurcation. These are the jugular veins. This is a field map, actually somewhat uh, processed to, to correct for global magnetic field inhomogeneity to, to the shape of the object. And we can clearly see the uh, veins here, but we don't see the arteries. And this is just the phase scale. And we obtain a value for SVO2 of 65%, which of course is pretty much where you would expect it. We then just recently re-examined uh, this relationship by using essentially the same approach I, I showed you as for the phantom experiments with uh, gadolinium. But in this particular case, we used blood oxygenated to different levels. And these are the, the field maps. And from the slope of this relationship, we independently measure uh, oxygen saturation, I should say, using uh, blood gas analysis. We obtain this quantity. You can see if we extrapolate it to zero, then uh, there's a slight offset, and that offset is real, which uh, indicates that uh, it, it's, it, this was ex vivo blood. Yeah, the, I, I should say these experiments have to be done extremely carefully extremely carefully because blood is a juice that is not uh, particularly stable. There are some other concerns. Well, vessels are usually not exactly cylindrical. Uh, there are branches and, and there is tapering. And uh, for this purpose, we, we examined, for example, the femoral vein and the superior sagittal sinus. This one has a sort of a, a triangular cross section. And here we have significant tapering and branching. All right, OK. All right. So uh, we uh, computed the magnetic field distribution. You can see, for example, at uh, uh, location two in the femoral vein. So these are essentially 3D reconstructions from venograms. When we compare this to the analytical solution, it looks very, very similar. And if we assume uh, actual HBO2 of 65%, sort of the mean value we typically observe, these would be the computed values assuming the cylinder approximation. So it, this really works quite well. Now, why is this important and what is it? Uh, CMRO2 quantifies the oxygen demand of the brain. We have heard quite a bit this morning 
from uh, Bob Shulman's lecture. Uh, of course, it is an important uh, marker of brain function and health. We uh, would like to understand cerebral physiology during rest, sleep, anesthesia, and uh, Bob uh, actually gave us some examples uh, obtained with uh, very different technology. And there are various uh, possible clinical applications, monitoring patients with congenital heart abnormalities where the blood is mixed. In other words, they don't really get arterial uh, uh, blood. Uh, it provides us uh, with a tool for evaluating the implications of apneas. Uh, on brain metabolism, we have a project uh, in, in progress, and we can study various hemoglobinopathies. So if we want to estimate CMRO2, well, we just resort to fixed principle. CMRO2 is proportional to cerebral blood flow and the arterial venous uh, difference. So if we assume this to be 98 or 100 percent, all we need to do is we have to measure SVO2. And of course, the flow we can obtain relatively easily by uh, measuring the velocity through the major uh, inflow conduits, the uh, carotid artery and uh, the, the vertebral arteries. So we use an approach where we essentially toggle between two locations. We measure SVO2 in the superior cervical sinus and uh, the uh, the, the, the flow uh, lower in the, in the neck. In principle, we could, of course, also measure SVO2 in, in the jugular veins, but it turns out this is much more difficult because of these uh, inhomogeneities resulting from uh, uh, air spaces. But, so the, the, the principle is relatively simple. We designed a pulse sequence that toggles between two locations, in a, an interleaved pulse sequence, first at the level of the superior cerebral sinus, then we switch to the neck, go back to the superior cerebral sinus, this is all for a given case baseline, and just to shift the, the echo and a, a fourth interleaf, and the only difference is that we move this gradient slightly to change the, the first moment. So we have all the tools that uh, essentially allows us to compute HBO2 from interleaves 1 and 3. Uh, interleaves 2 and 4 give us CBF. And we can do this with a uh, temporal resolution on the order of half a minute. So here, velocity image, magnitude and uh, phase image, or uh, calibrated for velocity. And the measurements in the superior sagittal sinus, here the phase difference image in uh, a cross section. So that uh, uh, works uh, quite well. And if we do this and uh, plot the arterial venous difference versus CBF, we obtain the straight line. There's an inverse uh, correlation between the two, which uh, obviously makes sense the faster the flow assuming that CMRO2 is constant, uh, the less oxygen gets extracted. We published this, is, uh, this last year in JCBFM. And uh, these are the values in uh, 10 subjects, 127 plus minus 7 micromole per 100 gram per minute. This is uh, exactly on where you would expect it and where others have reported uh, uh, CMRO2 uh, using other means. These are uh, the results of a, a repeat study and you can see, so we did each subject three times, uh, the values are uh, uh, pretty tight. So we can do this with uh, quite good uh, reproducibility, the mean CV on the order of 3% for uh, uh, all uh, three values, uh, intra-class correlation coefficient as a measure, measurement of reliability is uh, between 0 .9, 0 0.95 and, and 0.98. So we were pretty, pretty happy with this. But there are CMRO differences, and we think that these differences are real. 
albeit small, as you can see from, from the scale. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, we, we, of course, also need to quantify the volume of the brain, but that can be done uh, very easily with uh, modern MR techniques. Uh, the response to a stimulus, uh, here we investigate the key question, uh, what happens if we apply a stimulus such as, uh, well, obviously, the most uh, common neural stimuli, uh, such as cortical activation, are regional. And I, I should say, and this is a limitation right now of this technique, that is a, a global technique. It's not, not a regional technique. Nevertheless, there are many interesting uh, neuroscience questions that uh, can be addressed. Uh, the effect, for example, of vasodilators, hypercapnia. Uh, I'll show you an example. Anesthesia. It's more difficult to do, at least uh, from a regulatory point of view. In, in, in humans, in animals, it, it's not so difficult. And we have a project working on sleep. Even that is not easy to do. This is the apparatus we, we set up. Uh, the subject breathes uh, room air with 5% CO2 in a Douglas bag uh, that uh, allows for constant flow. And we have uh, various uh, uh, kinds of physiologic monitoring. Uh, we measure the heart rate, for example, because heart rate goes up uh, uh, quite uh, dramatically. And we me measure arterial saturation with a pulse oximeter. Now, these are the typical results. Uh, you can see superior sagittal sinus, again, uh, in cross-section. So we do this, as I said, with about uh, 30 seconds uh, temporal resolution. So uh, the phase contrast is less. That means uh, the blood is more oxygenated as a result of increase in flow. Of course, it extracts less. And here we can nicely see the increase in flow, and we get curves like these. So the two parameters change pretty much in concert, and we can see SVO2 goes up during hypercapnia, returns to baseline flow, goes, goes up, and uh, there were no significant differences in CMRO2. I'd like to show this brief video, and you may want to focus on either the left or the right panel, see what happens. A, 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 lower, a lowering of the face contrast during hypercapnia and similar, similarly an increase in flow in the carotids and, and vertebrals that can be quite uh, nicely seen here. These are the results from a, a few volunteers. Baseline hypercapnia for SVO2, returning to, to baseline. And this is uh, highly uh, statistically significant. So flow and oxygen saturation change in concert during the stimulus. And the intervideal differences uh, can be quite substantial, but there is no difference in CMRO2 between states, and this has been debated, and uh, uh, there is literature in support of this and against uh, this finding, but we have uh, quite a bit of confidence uh, that uh, this is real. Finally, uh, we can do other things with this technology, such as uh, time-resolved venous oximetry as a means to assess vascular reactivity. Now, uh, one uh, possible experiment uh, uh, during arterial and venous cuff occlusion, so we, we apply a cuff to the thigh, and uh, of course, uh, if we do this for three or five minutes, and we actually occlude both. We occlude both the, the artery, the femoral artery, and the femoral vein. Uh, oxygen keeps on uh, being extracted, and you would expect the oxygen saturation to uh, uh, 
go down to maybe 30%, even sometimes less than that. But up on cuff release, the desaturated blo blood returns and gets replaced with the normally saturated blood. So we expect a dip as we monitor the, uh, the oxygen saturation just slightly distal to the cuff. So this uh, temporal response we think is a measure of vascular reactivity and we have actually applied this to patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease and we see dramatic differences. But of course, that is not really so interesting because we know that these people are sick and there are other means to, 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 to study them. We are more interested in early atherogenesis like uh, endothelial dysfunction for example, comparing young smokers to non-smokers. And uh, once you've seen the results, you probably don't want to smoke anymore. But here's the idea. Baseline for a certain period of time, then cuff occlusion. We are not particularly interested in what's going on during cuff occlusion. So this is the arterial saturation. You can see it hovers right around uh, 100%. We also measure this with the uh, with the uh, uh, dynamic susceptometry. Uh, baseline saturation in this subject was a, a little higher. And upon cuff release, this desaturated blood now rapidly flows through the measurement slice. We see this dip and recovers. There's an overshoot before it returns to baseline. And there are a number of parameters we can measure. We can measure the depth of this uh, dip. This requires pretty high temporal resolution. We, we are working on a way to augment it here. We have five seconds of, uh, of temporal resolution because we, we measure only oxygen saturation. This is not like measurements in the brain. We can measure the washout time. Uh, that's a measure of how intact the vascular system is. We can measure the upslope and the overshoot. And here is a, another movie, which is actually quite neat. So I would say you fo this is just a, an expansion here of uh, this, this region here. And see what happens. So the phase contrast increases pretty dramatically and it slowly returns to baseline. This is a, a very healthy subject for the graduate student. I'm going to show it, show it one more time, should you have missed it. What's going on? So we just uh, uh, got uh, funded by the NIH to, to study this in uh, Smoker, smokers and non-smokers in young people because you would like to capture uh, people at risk early before uh, disease is uh, symptomatic. So in conclusion, we call this technique MR susceptometry. It provides us with a quite a robust uh, means to quantify hemoglobin uh, oxygen saturation in situ, in, in, in vivo, in, in human subjects. Uh, there is another method that is based on T2, and it's actually based on, fundamentally, on uh, 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 Zeev-Lussi's uh, work from the 1960s. Uh, T2 is modulated by uh, uh, diffusion of the, of the water molecules in these intrinsic gradients. So uh, the, the T2, the effective T2, is shortened uh, in the, the, the oxyhemoglobin. But the, this method, we think, has the advantage that there is no calibration necessary in terms of a, a calibration curve, which is a function of the, uh, of the carpal cell interpulse uh, uh, rate. It's also a function of the magnetic field strength. We, we don't have that. The only thing we need to measure, but everybody has to measure uh, that, that's the hematocrit, which uh, is easily accessible. So joint quantification of venous and arterial oxygen saturation together with flow, which I've uh, shown you, 
provides a means for non-invasive evaluation of whole organ oxygen delivery and consumption with quite good temporal resolution. As I said, we are in the process of improving the, the temporal resolution further. So this allows assessment of abnormal neurovascular reactivity, such as in patients, uh, I've mentioned that before, but decided not to show it, with congenital cardiac abnormalities. Sleep apnea is, a, is another one. The response to induced uh, ischemia, I think I've shown that as a means for evaluating endothelial dysfunction. The techniques, like any other method, has, uh, has uh, uh, limitations. And one is the need for a reference tissue. Uh, another one which I, I did not uh, mention here is uh, if the orientation of the vessel exceeds 30 degrees relative to the static magnetic field, then uh, there is increasing inhomogeneity of the, of the, the reference region. And uh, there has to be some compliance with the cylinder uh, model, even though other approaches are possible, such as solving the inverse problem. In other words, doing field mapping and compute the susceptibility in, inside the vessels. And we, we know that these inverse problems are uh, inherently ill-posed. We haven't done that yet, but we are considering doing it's potentially applicable to other organ systems, perhaps the, the kidneys. And it's also possible to regionalize the method. And that brings me to the end. I would uh, uh, like to recognize the people who have done the work. I have two extraordinarily talented uh, graduate students, Varsha Jane, Cheng Li. Uh, uh, Michael Langham is a, a, a research associate who just got the K grant. Jeremy Mackland and Charlie Epstein are mathematicians. And then we have uh, three physicians who were essential mainly uh, to the uh, uh, clinical work. And I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, support for these uh, specific projects from National Institute of Health. And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, the members of my lab. Thank you for your attention. I don't think that's possible. I mean, we, we really need a, need, need a, a vessel that is, uh, that is uh, well recognized. So right now, we have really applied this uh, primarily to the brain for quantifying CMRO2. And uh, it should be possible to do this in, in other organs. All right? Delta height, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, uh, you know, you, you, it's a delta. It's a difference between the, the reference tissue and uh, the, the, the susceptibility inside the, the vessel of, of the blood. But I think I showed that the method is quite robust and this requirement for uh, a, a cylinder-shaped vessel, it can really be uh, greatly relaxed, even if there is some tapering. The superior sessile sinus uh, radiologists know that actually it has a triangular cross-section, and yet uh, it, it works quite well. <laughs> 